a small variation of object properties is to use them as a way to organize your functions and avoid name conflicts rather than as real objects. So here's the idea. You have many related functions and you want to group them together so that they have similar names. Think of the built-in math class. Well, you never make an instance of the math class. You just call math.min, math.max, math.cosine, math.round, math.random. All of those methods are related and they're really different functions. They just all start with the word math. Dot. But all starting with the word math. Dot is convenient. First of all, it's just syntactically, they look similar, so they're easier to remember. And secondly, it's easier to avoid name conflicts. So that the only thing I have to worry about if I defined a class called math is if somebody else had a class called math. I didn't have to worry if someone else has a method called cosine or round or random because I grouped them together underneath the math class. And so this is a very important practice in your project. Group all of your functions under a name so that if another developer on your project loads a file and happens to choose the same function name, it won't conflict with yours. You just have to worry about the top level class variable like math. That one you have to discuss with the other developers and make sure that it's not reused. But all the rest of your functions, you can do whatever you want. It's not going to conflict with anyone else. This is also true when you're loading external JavaScript libraries. For example, in jQuery, which we'll discuss later, every single method in all of jQuery is grouped under either the dollar sign or the jQuery object class. So that the only thing you have to worry about is a name conflict with the variable dollar sign or the variable jQuery. You don't have to worry about name conflicts with any of the other functions. And if a function you write happens to have the same name as one of the jQuery functions, no problem. Because the jQuery functions are grouped under a separate variable. All of the commercial Google applications do the same thing. So if you use Gmail and you look at the JavaScript code, you see that all of the functions are grouped under a variable called Goog. G-O-O-G. Well, the library called Clojure that Google uses is also available to outsiders, just like jQuery is available to outsiders. And if you load that library, you don't have to worry that one of Google's JavaScript functions conflict with your JavaScript function. You only have to make sure that you don't define a class called Goog. All your functions can have whatever name they want because they're grouped separately. And so if you've seen other programming languages, this is similar to the idea of static methods. It's just a way of grouping functions so that A, they have similar sounding names, and B, you're less likely to get name conflicts. So the syntax is you assign functions to an object, just like we did with regular objects. But you never have a constructor. You're never going to build instances of that object. It's just a way of storing a bunch of functions under a name. So first you just make up a name. Okay, This name you have to worry about name conflicts with. So if you're on a project and you're going to group all your functions under the name utils, you have to talk to the other developers on your project to make sure they don't use the name utils. But once you've determined that, you don't have to worry about conflicts with your individual functions. Because your individual functions you group under utils. So I say utils.foo equals such and such a function. Utils.bar equals such and such a function. And then when I call it, I call it by its full name, utils.foo and utils.bar. So you never actually say function foo. Instead you say utils.foo equals a function. So you really are taking an anonymous function and assigning it to a property of a class. And so this is a little bit less convenient than just typing function foo, but it's an important strategy. First of all, related functions are grouped together. 
math.min, math.max, math.sine, math.cosine, math.round, math.random, and so forth. Oh, it's very natural. Oh, I just look at the math class. I can see what all the definitions are. And secondly, you don't have to worry about name conflicts. If I define a method called round, I don't care that there's also a method called round in the math class because my method called round is under utils or some other name, not under math. OK, so let's make an example. If I want to make some mathematical utilities, I cannot call my class name math. Math already exists. So I make another name. But the point is, only the top level names are places where you have to worry about name conflicts. So I just make up a name, math utils. And if I look in the math class that's built in, it has a function called log, but it does log base e. Supposing I'm doing a bunch of calculations where I want log base 10. Well, I can easily convert from log base e to log base 10 with a little bit of simple high school math. And so I define a function called log 10. But I stick the log 10 function inside math utils for two reasons. One, syntactically, it'll look convenient because all of my math utilities will be grouped together under the same name. They all start with math utils dot something. And secondly, I don't have to worry about name conflicts. If someone else in my team makes a method called log 10, as long as they don't stick it in the math utils class, I don't have to worry about a name conflict. However, I also want to point out that the name with the dot is the name to be used everywhere. So in programming, there's this idea of recursive functions, functions that call themselves. So if you think of factorial, factorial is just the product of consecutive numbers from one up. So for example, 2 factorial is 2 times 1. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And of course, if I told you to define a function to compute the factorial, you could do it with a loop. But there's also a recursive approach. You say, well, the factorial of 1 is 1, and the factorial of any larger whole number is that number, say 5, times the factorial of the next smaller number, 4. So if you've never seen recursive programming before, it's a little hard to grasp from this quick example. But the point is that if I'm going to call my name MatthewTills.fact, then I have to be consistent. Even in my recursive call, I call it MatthewTills.fact. OK, let's just make some function calls to illustrate what I mean. So to recap, I make a variable called MatthewTills. And it's just an empty object. And then I take my functions, in this case log10 and fact, and I stick them inside the MatthewTills object as properties. It groups things together, so syntactically it seems natural. I've got a bunch of functions under MatthewTills. They're all related to each other. And it helps to avoid name conflicts. If other people on my project define functions, I don't care what those functions' names are unless they're in the class called MatthewTills. All right, so I run that, define them all. And now if I want to compute some factorials, I cannot just say fact. If I say fact of 1, it's going to tell me there is no such function called fact. I have to do mathutils.fact. So they're still regular functions. They just have dots in their name. Factorial of 1 is 1. Factorial of 2 is 2. Factorial of 3 should be 6. Factorial of 4 should be 6 times 4, 24, and so forth. And I can s compute the log base 10 of 10, obviously, should be 1 of 100 ought to be 2, of 10,000 ought to be 4, and so forth. OK, so it's not very complicated. It's just a way of grouping your functions together, but it's an important strategy. You should always do this for real life code. Every function you ever write for code on a real life project that you're going to deploy should do this. And the reason is to avoid name conflicts. If you're just a little solo programmer and you've got your own independent project, it's not so important. But if you're on a team, and the page that you're going to apply your JavaScript code to might have someone else's JavaScript code in it also, then you have to worry about name conflicts. So get in the habit. Do this routinely for real life projects from the very beginning.